let's say John chapter 3. The third John, uh, the third letter that John wrote, uh, this is also the, uh, the Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John. But we're back just before Revelation, if you'll go there, to the third letter that he wrote. And I want to bring a message to you in these next few weeks regarding, and you can see why I kind of separated it for a little bit from communion, politics in the church. <laughs> and I want to talk to you today and in these coming weeks about how when we, when we have things in our life that are important, we talk about them. And I want to bring a fresh view of, of something that we, we just kind of push off into some other place, like it's something, some manner of evil. And I want to help you understand just how we can work through things, beliefs that we have, and values that we hold dear, that in fact uh, could be labeled as politics. So let's just get into this subject a little bit today, and, and uh, you'll kind of catch on as, as I go. Now in the third letter of John, the third John we should call it, um, I want us to read a few the verses together. I'm going to read from verse 5 uh, all the way through verse 12. So if you'll follow with me there. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men, so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil is, has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the words of men writing to friends that truly are the word of God. You've used us, Lord, in all of your days in this kingdom to bring glory to your name. And this morning, we want to bring glory to your name by not only reading your word, but receiving it and studying it and hearing a message that would help us to take it to heart and to receive its truth. Lord, speak to our hearts today, especially in these days when there is politics in the land and maybe even among us today. We pray that you would just guide us in our words now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before you shoot me over my subject announcement, know that when I pick a topic or a passage of Scripture, I do seek the Lord fervently. This is one of those times. First of all, I love politics. I'm sorry. I just do. Because for some reason, it ultimately brings out the truth in all of us. Have you noticed how some pretty quiet spirits, some quiet people come unglued if a political discussion kind of comes forth? All of a sudden, they are animated in their spirit. I think this is why we might even get angry over subjects like poverty, joblessness, the economy, and prejudice. These are things worth fighting over. Of course, to stand here provoking you to anger is not my goal, nor should we tend our hearts in such a way. But all that said, it is our duty to talk about things that matter to God. So let's begin this series on the rules of engagement. That's why we're in 3 John. The rules of engagement, for it's in these these rules, these guiding principles that bring about the very subject of politics in the first place. The issue of fairness, right or wrong, or even respect or disrespect, are the very issues that make so many of us 
hate politics in the first place. Oh, the word hatred is not a harsh word when we think of our political landscape in these last few months. And the word hatred is not a harsh word when it comes to how strongly we feel about things that, that God also becomes angry about. As life continues to be extinguished in the mother's womb across our land, we come out of our, 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 our boots just wanting to make a change and cause everyone to come together and, and do right. It's a story about the Pope and the President meeting together. During his visit to the U.S., the Pope met with our president. Instead of meeting for an hour as scheduled, they stayed in their meeting room, had their meals sent in, and they spent an entire two-day period together. Finally, weary was the president emerged from the room where they were meeting to face the waiting news media. The president was smiling. And he announced that the summit with the, with the Pope was a resounding success. He said, in fact, they agreed on 80% of the matters that they discussed. A few minutes later, the Pope came out to make his statement. He looked tired, discouraged, and practically in tears. Sadly, he announced that his meeting with the President was a failure. Incredulous, one reporter asked, but your holiness, the president just announced that the summit was a great success and the two of you agreed on 80% of the matters that you discussed. But exasperated, the Pope answered, yes, but we were talking about the Ten Commandments. <laughs> oh, how we take the things that are most important and we tend to devalue the things that God puts value on. And so we have this Greek word uh, in, our, in our history called politikos, right, where the po word politics comes from. <coughs> and yet that word in the Greek does not appear in the scripture directly. So why are we talking about it today? Because of this next question. Is there politics in the Bible? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Just because a particular word is not in the Bible does not mean that the subject isn't there, and it is. Consider the meaning of politikos, politics, it's, it means of or relating to the citizens. Everything that relates to you and me. It's the process of making decisions, applying to all members of every group. More narrowly, it refers to achieving and exercising positions of government, organized power, uh, organized control over a community, uh, particularly a state. And so we have this subject in front of us. As soon as we begin talking about these matters important to us, especially for the, the commonwealth, the common good of our communities, we enter into political discussions. You see, we, we really do uh, have political conversations on a regular basis, but so often, for instance, in our church, much of what we discuss, we have in common. Oh, we might have disagreements with each other on our views on things, but there are so many things that we agree on, you know. We agree that it's, it's important to worship the Lord every Sunday morning. We agree that there is a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit that we should worship, and we come to Him under His banner of love and His promise of an eternity and a future with Him. These are the things that we value, and so our conversations so often are in harmony. 3 John is a book that, a letter that, that when it was written, really helps us understand this political disagreement, this struggle that the church was having uh, among its, its citizens or its believers. The passage in which we begin... Um, is, is the third letter of three letters. And so John is communicating, in this case, with Gaius, uh, one of the church leaders, and he's expressing these concerns of, uh, of I can't pronounce his name without looking at it, Diatrophes and, uh, and Demetrius, the one that was coming against the church and one that was supporting the church. 
that clearly deals with the conflict of one very poor leader in the church and one leader that truly understood what it meant to be godly, let alone virtuous in his leadership practices. John speaks first of Diotrephes and his blatant disregard for proper godliness. He's a controller. He's a selfish man. His, uh, he pushes people around for his own purposes. He reminds us why we hate politics. So notice in your, your notes there are five things that I've put in there to remind us of what Diotrephes was about. The first thing that we know about Diotrephes is that he loves to be first in verse 9. He loves to be first. He puts himself first before anyone else. And know this, when we put ourselves first, we accomplish nothing. Putting yourself first does not accomplish anything. Secondly, it says he gossips maliciously. Now, I suppose every one of us have had moments in our life where we said things that probably was information we shouldn't have shared. And so that would be termed gossip. And so uh, there's one thing to have co committed this, uh, this sin, or uh, this, this wrong, but this was not just gossip, this was malicious, this was with the intent to harm. And that's how far gossip can go when we do it. Thirdly, Demetrius, or excuse me, uh, Diotrephes, he refuses to welcome the brothers. And so he's just, he's, he's not only is he controlling, but he's shunning people. He, he won't welcome those that come to minister among them. This would be called favoritism. We could call it a lot of other things. But it was a, a separation, it was a dividing. There was this divisive spirit in, uh, in this man. And, and so he refused to welcome the brothers in verse 10. Also in verse 10, we see that he stops those who are welcoming. So not only does he not welcome the brothers coming in with the uh, uh, apostle message, but he uh, stops those and says, don't, don't you do that either. You do not have permission to welcome the brothers. And so there is this giant chasm in the church of authority and discomfort. And so he makes it impossible for others to be welcoming. And then the fifth thing that I notice here is that he even puts out of the church those who are welcoming. You've got to leave. You can't even be here. What a divisive man. What, a, uh, what kind of person would this be? Well, how could a church even function? And yet, they're functioning, aren't they? They're there. If these five descriptions don't define a politician, I don't know what does. We have recently watched the candidates of all kinds in the primaries tear each other apart. And then five minutes later, they're running mates. The strategies of getting elected alone are enough to turn our stomach this morning. But here's what I find amazing. What, what we see so graphically on a national scene calling it even as difficult as, as grotesque or, or totally without friend, without friendship, without fellowship. We also know that this can happen in our lives every day. You see, we can do the very same thing to each other. We can sugarcoat our criticism. We can, we can be a, a person who create division within the body of Christ. And we can do it in such covert ways that we undermine the very uh, foundation of a church. We can't do that. Because Diotrephes shows us that he can do it. You see, loving to be first and gossiping are not that hard to do when you are with your close friend when you're having these selfish motives, when there's something you want, when there's someone that you just don't like. Or maybe something they did. Or something has come between you, and that divisive spirit begins to grow, and it festers, and, and God begins to, 
uh, to deal with it. And so there's a, another battle going on. There's the battle of a breakdown in relationships. And then there's, a, th then there's this God that we have in our life, uh, our, our Lord, who says, stop. And then we struggle with stopping and we, we sin some more in this area of putting ourselves first and, and gossiping about others, just being total, totally a, a person of disarray to others. It grieves the heart of God when, he, when we do this. How many of you would describe churches that were not welcoming, pushing, seeking hearts right out the front door because they weren't quite the right ethnic group. They weren't quite the right level of income maybe. Or, or they just didn't seem to look like us. Or they're not related to anyone in this church. Because everybody knows that everybody in the church is related to each other. I don't think that's true here. There's, these are the things that can creep in. Those are the politics that we see in the church. This is preaching for sure. Are you at Diotrephes this morning? Do you find some of his ill in your life? I can look back over my life, and if I go over the entire list of people I've known in my life, I can find some people that I had to get over. Some people maybe that hurt me. What's my attitude in my heart now? Are you at Diotrephes today? Again, in this apostle, John is writing to Gaius about a specific man and his less than virtuous attributes. That alone has political uh, politics written all over it. Some might have this kind of letter kept un un under wraps, but, but now it's being written for everyone to see. Diotrephes' name has been read by untold hundreds of millions of people when they read the Bible. John and Gaius... They're, they're brothers in the Lord and they affirm one another and they're searching for new ways to do church, new ways to spread the gospel because the gospel was still spreading far and wide in this day. But they still had to deal with difficulties in the church. If speaking against diatrophies is not enough, John then positions another man that he references, Demetrius, as a truthful man in contrast to an ungodly one. And here's what he says. Listen to this verse about a true churchman for Demetrius. Demetrius is well spoken by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I see five things about Demetrius right here. First of all, everyone speaks well of him. Isn't there something about people who speak well of us? I believe that Christianity spreads best when we are speaking well of each other. When we affirm each other. The world is watching us. Are we pulling for each other? Do we believe in each other that we would in fact of lift others up so that they can be seen higher than me, higher than the person, higher than you. Can we lift people up and say, I want to help you be successful in your place in this ministry and to, and to see us move forward? Do we, do we, uh, are, are we caught supporting one another? Again, I was talking with someone this week about, about what we can do to be more attractive as a church. And as I was studying in, in Acts 2 and, and asking, this was a church, the early church was the kind of church that was attractive to, to everyone. They were uh, speaking in at least 16 different languages. Uh, let me set the story up better. In, in the region of Galilee, where the disciples were from, the apostles were from, they were speaking Galileans, it says in chapter 2. And, 
And then it says when the rushing wind came at Pentecost, they were speaking in tongues. But the tongues are different than what we deal with later on in the New Testament. This manner of speaking in tongues was 16 different nations being listed within those verses that they were speaking their language. They don't know my language. I know they don't know all these languages. That's what the people were saying. There was something that was drawing the crowds. And it says that rushing mighty wind drew the masses in. And later on when Peter preaches and says they were being accused of being drunk because they were so filled with the Spirit that Peter says, no, they're not drunk. And here's the gospel. And that same day they had a baptism for 3,000 people. Well, that's just a busy day, isn't it? And, and yet I ask myself, in contrast to our ministry here, what is it that attracts people to Jesus when they're with us? I don't mean just here in the sanctuary. Yes, when we're here in the sanctuary. But when we're out and about and we're in the restaurant and we speak of one another. Are we speaking in ways that we're lifting other people up and saying, there's, there's this person, you just don't know how, how much a godly woman or man this is. They just do so many wonderful things for God's kingdom. Let me tell you another story. And we tell stories on other people. We affirm them. That's what John was saying about Demetrius. Everyone speaks well of him. There's just this, this absence of jealousy, this absence of division, this absence of any immoral thought. But look again at the second part of that verse, verse 12. John says, truth speaks well of him. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't know truth could talk. But it says in this passage that truth speaks well of Demetrius. And, and so Demetrius is a man of truth, and he lives truth so purely and so simple that the very life he lives speaks his message. So he's, he's got this message, he's in the church, he's trying to be a blessing in the midst of a man like Diotrephes, and, and as he... And as he ministers, he stays pure. He doesn't play by the same rules that Diotrephes plays by. Well, if Diotrephes is going to do that, then I'm going to do this. You don't hear that, do you? Truth speaks well of him. When you truly live by the truth, truth will speak well of him. Anyone here needs someone to testify for you? There's not a person in this room. I shouldn't say this. I'll say it. it may, maybe it's not always true. Almost always, there's hardly a person in this room that got a job without somebody giving them a vote of confidence. You have to have a refuge, don't you? I want to encourage you, at, at least be nice to one person, because you're going to need them. <laughs> You know, we need people to speak for us. But before we even get to that, we're talking about truth is speaking for Demetrius. And, and it's, it's a loud voice. I'm talking about the definition of a church here. I'm talking about a church that has this foghorn that, that sees thousands of people run to Christ on a regular basis. I don't know about this particular church, but... But there are people that need the Lord that are coming to know Him. The word was spreading rapidly in this New Testament time. Truth speaks well of Him. Third, leadership speaks well of Him. The third part of verse 12. I love this. I mean, think about the negative the diatrophies and His unwelcome spirit earlier. His strategy to stop welcoming. His graphic dismissing of people out of the church. His, this, now contrast this with people speaking honor and love of others. Both are in this church, and it's, it's got to be uncanny for, for both to be so close to each other. Such a, a graphic, uh, uh, all I can think of is horrible person in diatrophies, and such a godly man in Demetrius. How can they be in the same place, and yet they are? 
They're both trying to be faithful in their walk in this church. And, and kind of a, a key moment came for me as I was studying this at this point. And this is what I thought. I wonder if this one aspect of the church where the Holy Spirit's presence in Demetrius can be seen so far and wide. Is this the calling card of the church? That the very foundation of a ministry, that people who say they know Jesus and people who share the loaf and the blood of Christ, the body and blood of Christ, who share that, is there this foundation of strength, of support, where they're always speaking well of each other. Leadership spoke well of Demetrius. Now this next part, I've got to change my notes just a little bit. I realized as I was uh, finishing up my, my thoughts last night, uh, number four says his testimony, the, the word is true. His testimony is true. But I need you to change one word right after the number four, change his to our. Our testimony is true. Now, you, you notice I put his, and when I went over my notes last night, I don't know how I got uh, that, 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 was that the second person in there, but I, I, got the wrong, uh, I got the wrong word. I totally missed this point, and it says our. One person telling the truth changes another person. But when everyone speaks the truth, you change the world. It wasn't just Demetrius, it was our testimony of him is true. Our testimony was true. So this was a strong church. Do we have a testimony within our hearts, friends, that's true as a church? I believe when our testimony is consistent with each other and we love each other well. I had someone come to me before the service and I did something that didn't help the body of Christ build up. Uh, and I mean, I'm going to go to that person after the service, and I, mean, I will speak to them and apologize for something. We make mistakes. Anybody with me? Please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. We make mistakes, and, and we even at times will sin. But when our hearts are made right, then we get put on a different list. When you and I make our heart right with God, and our hearts right with each other, then we get to put on this list. It's the list of King David. When God says, David, even though you blew it, he even made some major blow-ups in his life. God said of David, David's a man after my own heart. So, and when we make mistakes, we recover and we say, okay, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm going to go, I'm going to go take care of this. I'm going to go take care of this. Our testimony is true. And then the last thought I had in this, this same verse was their testimony of him was also true. You see, this kind of endorsement speaks so much of the kind of leadership that we would want in a political realm. Wouldn't it be wonderful? By the way, when I vote this November for a candidate of my choice, some people have said to me, how can you vote for that particular candidate? I said, I said to this person, I said, when was the last time you voted for a political candidate that was in complete harmony with your beliefs? I mean, we're already done, right? And it doesn't mean that I'm always right. But when I do that homework of, of trying to elect to our national leadership, a kind of godly man or godly woman that we need, right now we're not real happy with our choices, are we? No, no we aren't. No. <laughs> I didn't mean to change the focus of the service, but I did. I told you I was going to preach on public. We need godly leadership in our land. We need godly leadership in our pastor. We need godly leadership among our people. Every one of you are leading someone. Someone's watching you. 
And how you treat others. And how you fellowship. And how you affirm. And how you strengthen. Just take this one verse about Demetrius. And read it over and over again. And start to tell the story that's untold in between the words. There's, there's this incredible story. You could just unpack it all about Demetrius. And all he went through in his, in his church. Dealing with this difficult man. Politics. So I think, in closing, how, how important it is for us as a church. What's our calling card? What calling card do you have in your wallet, in your purse? What calling card do you have that, that says this is who we are? Dear friend, your calling card, your calling card is going to attract people to Jesus. Or it's going to push them away. What is it about us that the world's going to look at us and say, I can't wait to get that. Or are people coming in among us and saying, I can't wait till the service is over. Shame on us. Even when the pastor preaches well. What are we doing to be attractive to a world that needs Jesus? And that's the question I'm asking you right now. We worked also as a board to talk about our goals for how we're going to increase attendance on Sunday mornings. Now, we know that God grows the church. We get that. But it doesn't mean that we can't have our eye on a prize to say, Lord, help us to reach one more soul for Christ. We're hoping to grow by 10% this next year, or, or at least I've asked the board to consider that. I guess I'm tooting my horns a little bit too quick. But I believe that God wants more people to know Jesus. Do you believe that with me? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so we have to make room. And there is room, isn't there? But thank the Lord, you're the testimony, and so am I. And so wherever we go, we have to decide, are we going to be a Demetrius? Or are we going to be a Diophilus? <laughs> wow. We have a new favorite uh, movie producer down in Georgia. And they produced a, another movie, that I believe it was in the movie Courageous, that this Hispanic man walks into his employer's office and he, he says to his, uh, his employer, says to him, you've been recommended to be promoted in, in the business. The backstory of this Hispanic man of color, he wasn't sure if he would be honored because of his heritage. And he was scared and he told his friends, his close friends, how concerned he was about what was going to happen. He was called into the boss's office. I believe there were four men sitting at the, the table in front of him. And they said, we're, we're thinking of promoting you to another level in the company. And that made him excited. He says, but, so we need to ask you a few questions. And they began to interview him. And they came up to this one question. And they said, listen, companies move forward however way they can. So we need to know one particular thing about you. When there comes a time when you have to shade the truth or not speak in complete candor with a vendor or someone and we ask you to say something less than the truth, for the sake of the company, would you be willing to do it? This joy of being promoted went to an ashen face of, of despair. Because he was a godly man. And he stood there and his shoulders shrunk down. And it was in that moment that he began to share his testimony. A testimony he really didn't want to share, but he knew he had to. Because he wasn't about to lie. And he said, gentlemen, I, I love working for this company. And, the, and if this is my dismissal, then it is. <coughs> I need this job really bad. But I don't need it enough to do what you're asking. The gentleman said, we were hoping you would answer that way. <laughs> and he was affirmed and promoted and given the job. They wanted to know if he was trustworthy. What is our calling card? What is it? that we're going to live by? Are we going to confront each other when it's time to confront? To speak the truth whenever we have to share it? 
I'm asking. I'm asking the Lord, Lord, how do we as a church look like this bright, shining light so that others are attracted to your kingdom? If, if no one's coming to know Christ in our midst, then Lord, something's wrong. This is still the New Testament church. I know we live in America where hedonism and materialism reign, but not for us. Amen? Amen. We don't let our stuff get ahead of our values. We let our values fill in the concrete foundation of who we are as people. And that's politics I'll fight for. Let's pray. Let's have the worship team come up and prepare. Jesus, we only have to read the news when we hear of the shootings, the horrible violence, lives being taken every day, people who have not yet responded to the gospel die every day because the light is not bright enough to attract them to the gospel. Oh Lord, we know that every person has to choose Jesus or not. But we want our light on the hill to be so bright. Lord, our vision is to take the light of Christ to our world. Lord, how bright is our light? We, we want to confess right here and right now that our light is not as bright as it should be. God, help us to take these principles of Demetrius and to let them create a brighter light for us as a church. Help our, our leadership and our followership, our church of fellowship, be so filled with love that people would say, I've never seen such love. May it be true of us. And may that be the kind of politics that's worth fighting for. And all God's children say,